I have a disclaimer in that because of what I'm going to teach on today, you may feel like at times that I'm preaching to the choir. Okay, I'm very well aware of that, and I, I, I certainly don't mean that. But I think you'll understand as we get into it, the, the topic that I'm going to talk about and the nature of it, it just it naturally is going to feel like I'm preaching to the choir. I'm not doing that because I think that none of you guys know this. It's just I couldn't, you, you'll see when, I'm, when we get into it, some of these things in this study, I just couldn't leave out. If I did, I wouldn't be doing justice to what I was talking about. But it may feel like you're preaching to the choir. And, you know, there may be somebody here that needs to hear what I have to say. Uh, so maybe the, in that case, the choir does need to be preached to just a tiny bit. So anyway, so uh, what we're going to talk about today, the title, and this is just my own little working title, but uh, I called it the Matthew Project. I mean, now, I love this guy. Now, you guys love this guy. If you've watched The Chosen, he's my favorite character. I love Matthew. But actually, we're not going to talk about this guy, Matthew. And we're not actually going to talk about the Matthew that wrote um, the book of Matthew. We're really just going to be talking mostly, oh, by the way, kids, don't draw that dog. Okay, that's not part of it. Just want to throw that out there. Uh, actually, what we're going to be talking about mostly today is Yeshua's words as recorded in the book of Matthew, but not really anything to do with uh, Matthew. Okay? All right. Uh, so, it all started, this Matthew project, and that's just my own stupid little title, but it all started when I read this quote on Facebook. Now, my teaching today is going to lend itself, Ellie, to a lot of um, reading. I'm going to need you guys to do a lot of reading for me. So, Ellie and Josiah, um, be strong there, grab it. They are going to be roaming through the audience, and every time I have a scripture, uh, I really want you to just raise your hand, make a motion, get them over there, and uh, one on one side, one on the other. And uh, it'll help me a lot if, um, if you guys be really aggressive and uh, help us out with the reading. Okay? So, start it off. Who's, who's got this? This is the quote that I read on Facebook that, uh, that kind of started my whole thought here. Go ahead, Mr. Olson. It has been estimated that over one-tenth of Yeshua's recorded New Testament words were taken from the Tanakh, from the Old Testament. In the four Gospels, 180 of the 1,800 verses that report his discourses are either Old Testament quotes or Old Testament allusions. Thank you. Now, this Facebook friend that put this on Facebook, he's a, he's a wonderful Christian man. I have no reason to doubt anything he would say. Um, you know, I... I read most of what all my friends say. And uh, his, his main point in posting this was that we as Christians need to take advantage of Yeshua's words because they give insight into the Old Testament. And there are times when we don't understand the Old Testament. If we look at Yeshua's words that he quotes from the Old Testament, that should give us some insight into the Old Testament. And I thought, yeah, that's... A, that's a valid point. I think that's a very good idea. But something caught my eye, and something really stuck out to me when I read this quote. I just couldn't get away from it. I kept thinking, really? Only one-tenth of everything that Yeshua said was from uh, a quote or an allusion to the Old Testament? I just, I just kind of thought it would be higher. Um, now, I'm not at all trying to cast anything negative on Harold Wilmington. Uh, I never heard of it. Anyone ever heard of this man? I never heard of him either, but I, I looked him up and did some research. And he is a, was, he's passed away now, a very uh, learned and impressive Bible scholar. So uh, who am I to criticize Harold Wilmington, you know? But uh, it just seemed low to me. I thought, really? There's got to be more than one-tenth of Jesus' words, Yeshua, the quotes of Jesus. Um, it's got to be more than that. So I tried to be a Berean, and I started doing my own 
study. I wanted to verify if this was correct and see um, if, it, if it was or, or was not. So um, I decided to start with just Matthew. And uh, Harold Wilmington is talking about the whole, all four Gospels, of course. And that was a little bit overwhelming for me to do it all. And I thought, I'll just, I'll just start with Matthew. So I started going through Matthew and uh, to see if I could check um, up on what he said. Now, I started, though, by the way, looking at more uh, where Harold Wilmington got this statement. When I traced that on, um, on the Internet, it led me to this little chart here. So this is something that uh, Harold Wilmington put out. And um, it has some bullet points below. There was a second page, a few more bullet points, and then it had that quote that we read. And that's the only thing I could find on the whole Internet uh, regarding this particular quote. Um, so he never really states in this that this is an exhaustive list. He states that, uh, you know, there's 180 uh, times that it's quoted or alluded to. Um, so he never really says, here are all, all 180, but he doesn't say it's not either. So I'm not a really 100% sure how to take that. But uh, anyway, I studied this thoroughly. I checked all the parallel passages. I tried to look uh, as closely as I could. And to the best of my ability, what I came up with when I studied all this, there were 19 references. And that's just in Matthew. So... You know, Matthew is one of the four Gospels, so maybe you could, you know, multiply that by four. Might give you the number. I don't know exactly. Like I said, I, I stopped just with Matthew at this point. Um, but uh, it led me to believe, again, I kept thinking, it's got to be more, got to be more. So I put together my own chart, and uh, this is what my chart looks like. This is the first page of it, and I... I use a little different um, topics than he did in my headings up there. But it's basically the same type of chart. I had it on two pages. Sorry, I didn't try hard enough to get it on one. But um, anyway, just as I suspected, uh, when I studied it as much as I could, I came up with 66 references. Okay, so uh, now, I'm not tooting my own horn. That doesn't mean that I'm smarter than Harold Wilmington at all. Please don't think that. I just knew that number was too low from the way I'd studied the scriptures lately. And I said, that, that can't be right. So uh, anyway, um, it led me to think, maybe this is something we can talk about uh, in, in a meeting. So that's kind of what led to this whole thing. Um, so we're going to look at uh, the Old Testament quotes and allusions in Matthew today. And we want to remember my Facebook friend's encouragement to see if it can give us insight into the Old Testament, looking at Yeshua's word and give us insight. And I, I just want to say one thing. Think about this. Why does someone, when you go to hear uh, someone lecture or you read a book or hear someone teach something, why do they quote something? Have you thought about that? What is generally the reason they would quote? Isn't it? to kind of give validity and emphasize what they're talking about, you know, because they have a point to say, and to give it some, some, you know, validity, they say, this expert says this, and it substantiates what they're talking about. So um, that's what Yeshua is doing when he was teaching. He's quoting from the Old Testament. Um, but uh, if you don't know anything about the quote, or the person who someone quotes, and it doesn't really mean much. So you have to have a background, or you have to become aware of where the quote came from, or it doesn't really give you any validity. Um, so I think what I'm learning as I study this is that it works both ways. Yes, when we study Yeshua's words, he gives us insight into the Old Testament. But if you don't have uh, a knowledge of the Old Testament, then it doesn't, you can't understand what he's saying, what he's talking about. It works both ways. And I think you're going you're gonna to see that a little bit today. So, anyway, here we go. We're going to get going now. 
Um, this is where Dennis was going to play a song for me, but we don't have any internet today working. So who can sing this song for me? Does anybody know this song? Nobody knows? You? Oh, yeah. Y'all know this song? Yeah. Yeah. She, I love my wife, but she's not DC talk, is she? Okay. Oh, that's, a, that's a great song. So we are going to primarily be folks. Thank you, Amy. That was very brave of you to do that. We're going to be primarily focusing on the red letters. Those are the words in the, the Gospels or in all of the uh, that Yeshua spoke, the red letters, okay? Um, and we have a couple of verses that support what we're going to talk about. Who can read that one for me? You guys, you can't be sitting down. You've got to be there. You've got to run to it. You're not running, Josiah. Run, run, run. Most to present yourself approved to Elohim, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Yeah. We hope to rightly handle the word of truth. Here's another one. You can read this one. Yep. And the word became flesh and pitched his tent among us, and we saw his esteem. Esteem as of and only brought forth of a father, complete in favor and truth. So I think about, you know, is there any better way that we can rightly handle the word of the truth, the word of truth, than examining what the word became flesh, examining what the word says in the red letters? I mean, that's about as, as intense of um, a study as I can think of in terms of trying to understand uh, this all. And even the red letters kind of encourage what we're going to do today because he said that the Old Testament speaks about him, didn't he, right? You search the scriptures because you think you possess everlasting life in them, and these are the ones that bear witness of me, John 5, 39. Right. So I think this is a very valid way to look at things today. Um, and we're going to go through Matthew somewhat chronologically, um, and it's not going to be exhaustive. We don't have time to look at every single quote or allusion. I just picked the ones that I think are most important to what we're, um, our walk, basically. So here we go. We're going to actually get started now. Now, kids, maybe you see something up there that doesn't quite belong. If you see something that doesn't quite belong, draw it on your page, okay? You don't have to tell us what it is. You just have to draw it, all right? Draw it. Make it look exactly like it. Now, I need a reader. Who's going to read this for me? Hang on and to it, Johnny. You can get the next one. And the trier came and said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It has been written, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Then the devil took him up into the set-apart city, set him on the edge of the set-apart place, and said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, throw yourself down. For it has been written, He shall command his messengers concerning you, and in their hands, and in their hands they shall bear you up, so that you do not dash your foot against a stone. Yeshua said to him, It has also been written, You shall not try Yahweh your Elohim. Again, the devil took him up on a very high mountain and showed him all the reins of the world and their esteem and said to him, All these I shall give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, Go, Satan, for it has been written, You shall worship Yahweh your Elohim, and him alone you shall serve. Then the devil left him and see. Messengers came and attended him. So we're going to identify... The Old Testament quotes for allusion. We're going to look at the red letters, right? That means that's what Yeshua spoke. But what, what in the red letters are actually quotes or allusions to the Old Testament? Well, here is the first one. And that's from Deuteronomy, right? And then we have this one, right? Also Deuteronomy. And then we have this one, 
right? So we have, in this passage here, we have three actual quotes from the uh, Old Testament. So how does this help us better understand the Old Testament when we see what Yeshua um, said? Well, um, I will give you some of my thoughts, and then I really want you to give me your thoughts on how you see that it helps us understand. So specifically looking at this, when I studied this, I thought, well, um, first of all, we know that you can use the Old Testament to combat the enemy, right? Because that's what this is all about. The enemy is attacking, and what does Yeshua do? He starts quoting scripture. And um, so he's combating the enemy. And notice, well, it doesn't really say, but I'm assuming he was just out in the desert for 40 days um, and 40 nights fasting and praying. He probably did not have a collection of scrolls with him, right? So it's all from ahead. It's from memory. So he's prepared. He knows the scripture, okay? So if we're going to combat the enemy, we need to know the scripture. We need to have it in our heart. Um, notice who else is quoting scripture, right? It's not just Yeshua quoting scripture here. So uh, be ready. Uh, if you're quoting scripture, it might come back at you. So that's even more so reason why to really be on top of it. Secondly, I think uh, we know that um, the word not only protects us, but it sustains us. Every word, right? I, I came across this quote. We all know uh, Steve Mutria, and this is a pretty cool quote. If you only ate in the physical the amount that you ate in the spiritual, how would you be doing? Okay? So think about that for a second. In the physical, we eat three times a day, and most of the time when we eat, we eat till we're full, right? We fill it up pretty good at least in this country, do we do that with every word? We do that spiritually? Not me. I have to admit, I don't do that. How, how would we be doing if we ate as much uh, spiritually as we do physically? Or the other way around, how would we do physically if we ate as much physically as we do spiritually? So, something to think about. And uh, lastly, uh, the third part, I would just say we know uh, who to worship. This passage tells us who to worship. It tells us not to try him, to test him, to uh, tempt him. Uh, we're just to simply trust him and obey. Like that old hymn, Trust and Obey. I grew up with that song. I don't know if you guys know that. So, what are your thoughts on, do, do you see anything else? You know, raise your hand if you got something. Laura, get over there, Josiah. That's a great point. Put, use it. Put it in context with your life. It's not just head knowledge. It's to be used. Excellent. Anybody else? Okay, great. Well, so that's kind of what we're going to do today. We're going to zip through uh, the rest of these. So here's my next passage. I need a reader. Where's that? You both of you had a microphone. Why did you? Okay. Do not think I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod or one tittle shall not by no means pass away from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign in the heavens. But whosoever does and teaches them he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. For I say to you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall by no means enter into the reign of the heavens. Thank you. Okay. So there's no real quote here. This, uh, this is what I would call an allusion. Yeshua alludes to the Old Testament, right? He's alluding to it because he said... Uh, don't think I came to destroy the Torah and the prophets. So that's a pretty strong allusion uh, to the Old Testament. 
Now, this is going to be one of those preaching to the choir moments, right? Because I know you've all probably studied this passage and you've heard this, but again, I, I, it's too connected to what we're talking about to leave this out. If you're looking at Yeshua's words to help you understand the Old Testament, you can't not talk about this passage. That's the way I look at it because it's too connected. In some ways, it's maybe the most important passage in Matthew to help you understand the Old Testament. Most important quote from Yeshua or allusion to the Old Testament. Um, so we just have to look at that. And uh, what I want to do first, real quickly, is I just want to examine what would be called Torah and Prophets. Okay? What would Yeshua have called that? Now, you're probably all very familiar with the, the definition of Torah, but I just thought I'd throw that up there. Law, uh, direction, instruction. So that's what Torah means, of course. And um, traditionally, uh, this is what's been called the Torah uh, by Judah over the, uh, over the years. Okay? But what about prophets? What exactly are the prophets? And I actually learned something here when I studied this. I come to find out that uh, Judah traditionally has divided the prophets into two groups, former and latter, and the latter prophets are further divided into major and minor. Um, I, I would have never thought of uh, First and Second Kings as being prophets, but that's considered uh, by many in Judah in the, in the book of prophets. Now, also, uh, I, I didn't think, I had no thought that, that Daniel was not included. But I've come to find out that a lot of people in Judah don't consider Daniel uh, to be included in the prophets. Um, as I studied this more, I just, I, I didn't like that. And I thought, you know, well, Yeshua calls Daniel a prophet. So if he calls him a prophet, that's good enough for me. Uh, so I'm going to put, uh, I'm going to put Daniel in there. So anyway, um, here's what uh, we would call the Torah and the prophets. Um, so what does he say about this? What does Yeshua say? He says, I did not come to destroy all that up there. I didn't come to destroy that. Uh, not one jot or tittle is going to pass away till heaven and earth pass away. Right? That's what he's saying about those. Okay. Now, I know uh, many of you have seen this before. Again, just going to briefly zip through it. So hang on. We're going to go quick. You've all seen this uh, definition for um, Plerao. Uh, it's not the first definition when you look in Strong's, but it's the one that makes the most sense to this passage. If you think about it, that's the fully preach. That is exactly what Yeshua does in the following chapters in the Sermon on the Mount. He fully preaches the Torah. He, he, he gives examples of acting it out. Okay? So he is fully preaching it, uh, taking it to the, uh, the furthest extent there. Look at the word destroy. Now, this is interesting to me. This is, this is kind of the metaphorical definition. Render vain, overthrow, uh, bring it to naught. Um, I don't think anyone accused Yeshua of, th this is also the second definition in Strong's. The first definition was like destroy, to rip up, to you know, tear apart. I don't think anyone accused Yeshua of going into the synagogue and physically ripping the Torah scrolls. He didn't do that. But he might have been accused of rendering it vain, bringing it to naught, right? So this is what he said he didn't do, right? He said, I didn't render it vain. I didn't bring it to naught, okay? So I don't know. It's, uh, it, it's pretty interesting to me that he says that in his own words, but we trumpet in Christianity. We play the trump card. And we say, well, what about this? What about this? What about this? And all of those kind of bug me. Because why would we trump what Yeshua said? 
with another passage. Doesn't make sense. Your thoughts? So I find that interesting because he says, yeah, I think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. Well, he, he's speaking about the writings that they had. That would have only left the, the writings, which, what, what's that, Psalms? Yeah, <clears throat> Proverbs. So, in Proverbs, right. So he's, he's basically, he knows that there's going to be, he's saying this now, and he's saying, write this down, because he knows there's going to be another part of the Bible added. He knows that there's going to be the letters that Paul wrote. He knows that, that um, the Gospels will be written. And that someday, because it doesn't make sense at that moment, but someday there's going to be something else they could replace those with if they wanted to. But if he, if he wipes those out, it only leaves uh, the two books. So it doesn't, make, it doesn't even really make sense at this moment, but it, it does to us today. Mm. So he was a prophet in his day. Yeah, yeah. good. Good point. Excellent. Okay. Anybody else? All right. Moving on. Okay. I need a reader. Who's got it? Bovi. Come on, Bovi. Okay, Miriam. You're next, Bovi. Be ready. Stay awake. At that time, Yeshua went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his taught ones were hungry and began to pluck heads of grain to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your taught ones are doing what is not right to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he went into the house of Elohim and ate the showbread, which was not right for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only the priests? Or did you not read in the Torah that on the Sabbath the priests in the set-apart place profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the set-apart place. And if you had known what this means, I desire compassion and not offering, you would not have condemned the blameless, for the son of Adam is master of the Sabbath. Okay. So, let's identify our Old Testament references here in this passage. We have this uh, passage about David from 1 Samuel. Again, that's not really quote but he's definitely talking specifically about that passage there and then we have um, this again is not a quote but these are three different verses where it talks about the priests specifically working on the Sabbath they're serving um, so uh, that's that and then we have this famous uh, passage in Hosea now it's kind of worth noting here that this is actually the second time that Yeshua quotes um, this verse from Hosea in Matthew. Here's the other one, and Mr. Bovey's got this. And it came to pass as Yeshua sat at the table in the house that see many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his taught ones. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to his taught ones, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And Yeshua, hearing this, said to them, Those who are strong have no need of a physician, but those who are weak, but go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not offering. For I did not come to call the righteous to repentance, but sinners. So it would seem that this is pretty important to Yeshua. Because he quotes it twice in Matthew, right? Um, so, uh, let's kind of look at that and see if we can figure out. Um, I, I think one thing, you know, in both passages... He's implying that the Pharisees don't know what that means. You know, in both, in both passages, it's like, haven't you read Hosea? Don't you get it? Um, so let's look at this just for a second. Um, I am by no means an expert on Hosea, but I, I want to try to point out uh, some of the similarities in what Hosea uh, was saw in Israel versus to what Yeshua saw in Israel. Uh, the Pharisees. Uh, let's see if they if they compare. Would you say now this is Hosea? But would you say that Yeshua saw ungratefulness and pride in the Pharisees? Definitely saw pride. Um, what about idolatry? Probably not idolatry. I don't know. Um, but uh, lacking genuine truth, mercy, love, definitely that would be something that they would be um, accused of. Uh, 
rebelliousness, I don't know, insincerity. I think selfishness, yes. Uh, so, so for the uh, idolatry point, uh, along with the pride, they had ideas of what you had to use certain objects for and things that had to be done in a very specific way. Okay. Without allowing, well, grace or much of So that could be idolatry. Yeah. Okay, good point. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, worship from the heart. Uh, not, not from the heart. That would definitely be a Pharisee thing. So you can see, I think, that there's a connection between those, those passages. Um, I think Yeshua is teaching, uh, not just in Hosea, but in the whole thing, that your walk with the Father needs to be genuine, needs to be from the heart, you know, sincere, real, authentic, true. Um, so keep that in mind because we're actually going to come back to that quote a little bit later. I hope to make a connection. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? You have a thought? Stretching. Okay. All right. Zipping on. Here we go. Next reader. Who can read for us? Eliza, did you already read? Oh, you did. Over here. Oh, Laura's got it. Go ahead, Laura. All right. Then there came to Yeshua scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem, saying, Why do your top ones transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. But he answering said to them, Why do you also transgress the command of Elohim because of your tradition? For Elohim has commanded, saying, Respect your father and your mother. And he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say whoever says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received from me has been dedicated, it is certainly released from respecting his father or mother, so you have nullified the command of Elohim by your tradition, hypocrites. Yeshiyahu rightly prophesied about you, saying, His people draw near to me with their mouth and respect me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching as teaching the commands of men. Thank you, Laura. Now, before we identify the Old Testament quotes, I just want to clarify that uh, the context here, as it was already said, it's uh, eating with unwashed hands. The context really doesn't have anything to do with unclean food. Uh, so, you know, again, that might be like a preaching to the choir thing, but I don't mean it that way. Um, what we're discussing is this thing called not the lot. Now, uh, here are the quotes. We've got this one from Exodus and Deuteronomy. And we have Exodus and Leviticus, right? And then we have a nice one from Isaiah. I love this one in Isaiah here. Okay? Now, I, I just want to clarify. I don't know if it... Um, this passage about... Uh, the dedicating uh, gift. That has always kind of confused me. Uh, so I just want to kind of clarify um, in case you're a little confused on that. What we're talking about here is, you know, um, the Torah teaches that we're to take care of your mother and father, you know. And apparently there were those who would say, well, I'm sorry, mom and dad, I can't take care of you because what I would have used to take care of you I've already dedicated it to Yahweh or whatever, and I can't. You know, so they were they were using that type of loophole to get out of um, caring for their parents. So um, that that's what that is all about. It's kind of um, kind of confusing to me. So I'll look at that a little bit more. Um, uh, so I don't think Yeshua's words on the first two give us any special insight. They're just his quotes. He's kind of setting up what he's about to say about the Isaiah passage. Um, so what do we think about the Isaiah passage? 
what, what is he trying to teach here? Or what insights do his words give us into understanding Isaiah up here? Well, Isaiah is directly saying that they have had a little bit too much pride in their own hearts and have begun setting their own standards and rules that don't always make sense. It's a heart issue, isn't it? Yeah, their heart is not right. Laura has one. They were putting Jewish halakha, the oral traditions, the, above the actual scrolls of what was written by Moses and or Moshe, what was yeah. handed down as the actual word of God, that they were making it void with, right. with their supposed oral law. The you you got you to gotta know, you know what really, really matters. You can't uh, say this tradition is above what the scripture says. Exactly. Yeah. Good point. Amy? Well, I was just thinking it reminds me so much of, um, you know, things in the legal system today. It's like a loophole. And whenever you have loopholes, it's, it's clearly your heart is not in the law. It's exactly. Just, it's trying to, you know, get a, a little exception there to get out of your punishment or whatever. Yep. Um, but uh, that's just what it reminds me of. Yep. It, it looks to me, too, like it's a little bit of, for instance, it's okay to dedicate something, and it's also okay to care for your parents. And it, it looks to me like sometimes people don't know him well enough, me included, to understand his heart, Yahweh's heart. That's what Yeshua came to, to ex instruct in Yahweh's heart. But sometimes you can't keep both commands, like... Uh, uh, Circumcision. If it falls on Shabbat, what do you do? Well, you have. They had to spell it out for us. You you do the circumcision because that's more important than the Shabbat rest. You know, we see this at home. I see this whenever I do dishes. We have a dish strainer here, and in the dish strainer is a place for the utensils. You put the spoons in and the forks in, right side up, so that the eating part's not down and the part that's draining out because you don't want them to maybe pick up mildew or something. I don't know that's down in there. But, and they dry first. But you take the knives and you put them in pointed side down. Just the opposite. And why do you do that? You don't want to cut yourself. Because you don't yeah. want, yeah, the, the greater evil is that you would cut yourself. Yeah. So we are making these decisions ourselves, and we need to learn to be able to apply that in Scripture. And I think Yeshua came to help us with that, too. Fully preach. Fully preach. Thank yeah. you. Yes, excellent. Exactly. Anyone else? I would just like to say that I think this is an excellent study because in order for him to truly be the word made flesh, how could it only be a tent? Right. Right. Oh, boy. We, I, we're done. That's no need to go any further. Thank you, Laura. All right, moving on. That was our thoughts. Here we go. Need a reader. Who's got it? And Yeshua went into the set-apart place of Elohim and drove out all those buying and selling in the set-apart place and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those selling doves. And he said to them, It has been written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And blind and lame ones came to him in the set-apart place, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonders which he did, and the children crying out in the set-apart place and saying, Hoshiana to the son of David, they were greatly displeased and said to him, Do you hear what these say? And Yeshua said to them, Yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of babes and nurslings you have perfected praise? Okay. So let's identify our quotes here. We have... This one from Isaiah, House of Prayer. And a little bitty tiny quote here from Jeremiah 7. That's the only place in all the scripture that it says den of robbers. So it's definitely a little quote, you know. And then we have uh, this nice 
piece here from Psalm 8. Um, in just a moment, I, I want to look at this uh, quote um, about the uh, the Isaiah. Uh, help me out, because we talked to, you were mentioning House of Prayer, and uh, you stole my thunder a little bit, but that's okay. You do that all the time. But if you... If you, uh, if you really study Isaiah 56 here, uh, Yeshua is not talking really about the temple itself. You know, I mean, he's, he's talking about the temple, but Isaiah, I should say, is not talking about the temple itself. Um, help me out if I'm interpreting this wrong. But it's really more referring to the presence of Yahweh or, you know, being in covenant with Yahweh. Look, look at that scripture here. Someone read this for us. Here's a nice long one. Ye who steal my thunder. Okay, go ahead. Thus saith Yahweh, keep righteous, keep justice and do righteous, for my salvation is about to come. My Yeshua is about to come. And my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hands from doing any evil. Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to Yahuwah speak, saying, Yahweh has utterly separated me from his people, nor let the eunuch say, Here I am, a dry tree. For thus says Yahuwah to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Amen. Oh, yeah, keep going. Okay. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to Yahweh to serve him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my covenant, even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. Yuhua Elohim, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, says, Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. Thank you. Yeah, so that's not really talking about the temple itself, I don't think. It's more so just talking about being in covenant with uh, Yahweh and being in his presence. And what I really loved about this Notice all the references to keeping the Sabbath in this, you know. Uh, it, it, it gives me confidence because we're doing the right thing. All of us, you know, we're doing the right thing. This passage that Paul uh, wrote, he's talking about us. He's talking about you guys, you know. So keep the faith, everybody. We, uh, we, we're, we're heading in the right direction. So... Um, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, the, the thing that I gather from it is, you know, Yeshua's love and respect for the temple because that temple really reflects being in presence, uh, being in covenant, being in the, uh, with, the, with the Father. So that's the way I was looking at it. What, what are your thoughts on that? Other insights? When it came to the old temple, there was more than just a high priest that ran it. There were so many different people, different types of groups of people that served all the way down to your job is to watch the sheep in the valley. Your job is to bring wood for the fire. Every person that in the temple, there were a lot of temple workers. So in the spiritual sense of who is a temple, we all are part of a temple. We all have different assignments and groups. We might not all be the high priest. We all might not be the, the Levitical choir. But we all have a job. We all have a calling. And it just brought to mind that you know, the in, in, when Israel was divided into two different nations, and then they all went to exile. The ten, the ten tribes went into exile way before you know Judah did. And then Judah, Benjamin, Levi, uh, that, they went to Babylon, and they became, that's when they came up with the Babylonian system of worship that they have even today. <clears throat> but the other ten tribes did not learn that. And when we slowly see that 
the other ten tribes are coming back to Israel, they're like, we are Israel, we are not Judah. Mm -hmm. They are realizing that as a part of a whole, they have a different part of the system. Right. And that they don't have to be Judah to be a part of Israel. That's a good point. Thank you, Dennis. That's that's good. That's good. All right. Moving on. Need another reader. Who's got it? Raise your hand. Thank you, Debbie. And one of them, one learned in the Torah, did question, trying him and saying, Teacher, which is the great command in the Torah? And Yeshua said to him, You shall love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your mind. This is the first and great command. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands hang all the Torah and the prophets. Right, okay. Let's identify our quotes here. We have this one. Anybody recognize this? Sound familiar, right? Who, uh, who reads Hebrew? Oh, yeah. Shema Israel. Yeah. And then we have uh, another quote here. That's from Leviticus 19. So, and, uh, oh, yeah. And this is an illusion here. Because he says, all the, the Torah and the prophets, these commands uh, hang all on on these two commands, hang all the Torah and prophets. That's a pretty strong illusion right there, right? So, um, okay. Uh, let me see here. Bef did you want to say something or no? Yeah, I was just going to say, if Yeshua really did come to change the Torah, to change the law, to change all of that, or to put it to rest, this was his opportunity to say so right here. He could have said, you know, what are you worried about the, the laws about? The great commands, there wasn't any great ones. <laughs> yeah. He could have done anything. All you have to do is listen to my words at this point. He never did any of that. He, had, he could have said, you know, just for another six months or so, then it's all going to change. He never did any of that. Um, yeah. So why we have added to his words, uh, Father, forgive us. Amen. I just wanted to examine this word hang real quickly. Uh, in Greek, the definition is is summed up. And I read a article to Daniel Botkin, and uh, he wrote, he was talking about the Hebrew word um, for hang means depends on. I couldn't actually find that in Strong's, but I trust uh, Daniel Botkin. But uh, it, it gave me a little better understanding. I think it's it's fair to, to say, you know, that... Um, uh, the way uh, you understand and apply the Torah and the prophets to your life depends on and is summed up in how you love the Lord and how you love your neighbor. Um, so, you know, it, it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good thing for us to, uh, to understand. John. Right there. Yeah, it's right there. It's like, if you want to do the Torah and the Prophets, you got to be taking care of your family and your neighbor. Yes, sir. Oh, there's a, another point here. There's, um, in, in discussions in the past in my life, the question is, do we go, do we study Scripture thematically, or do we go expository? We just look at one passage by itself. Isn't it kind of frivolous to jump all around? and take things out of context. If you look at what he calls the second greatest command, it's not that he's pulling it out of context. He's simply taking the second half of the verse. The first half is saying, don't don't uh, find yourself in vengeance. Why? Because you're supposed to love your neighbors yourself. So right. it's, it's neat that there are times where Yeshua will, will grab a whole context um, a whole passage in context, and other times he takes a portion of it, not out of context, but a truth 
from a, a, a thought. Well, not even a, a summary, but it's, it's like one part. If I'm describing a story and I say, well, I, I put down the foundation and then I put up my walls and you go, ah, you have walls. And yeah. That's not the whole point. No, but it's in there. And he's, this is what he's doing. So there's so much from both uh, approaches. And I, I just love the fact that uh, if we just went with this, they'd say, wow, he kind of grabbed that obscurely out of half of a, a thought from a passage in in Leviticus, in, in Leviticus, it doesn't even uh, doesn't even start with Shema Yisrael. How do we know it's important? Yeah. Uh, well, Judah has kept that as near and dear to the heart, and Yeshua is aligning with that word that has been that that uh, belief that has kept for thousands of years. Amen. So we we can look at that and say, you know. Uh, Paul was right when he said, uh, what advantage has the Jew? He's, he's kept the Torah. You know, there are things about it that had to be sifted and corrected. Right. But how near, near and dear, and it should be to us. I want to connect this real briefly to another uh, passage. Um, look at this. Let's let's so keep that in thought in mind what you just said. Let's read this one. Who's got it? Go ahead, Eliza, if you want. Ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks it shall be opened. For is there a man among you who, if his son asks for bread, shall give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, shall give him a snake? If you then being wicked, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in the heavens give what is good to those who ask him? Therefore, whatever you wish men to do to you, do also to them, for this is the Torah and the prophets. Okay. So, pretty much kind of the same type of thought, right? Um, what the... Oh, there's our illusion, sorry. I didn't point that out. Another strong illusion because it's, he's saying this is the Torah and the Prophet. Uh, any more thoughts? It's kind of tying it all together, Laura. I'm sure you all know, and it goes without saying, that the first half of the Ten Commandments are our duty to Yahweh, and the second half are our duty to our neighbors. Thus, the statement's complete when he says that all the law it hangs on those two commands to love your God and to love your neighbor as yourself. Thank you. In a different uh, Bible study that we were doing recently, there's the passage where a man asks him, what do I need to do to get into heaven? And um, he ends up saying it's easier for a, a rich man to get into heaven than to go to the eye of the needle. But in that, he quotes him like the last six. He says, we'll do these. And he says the last six commandments. He's all I'm doing all of that. And s some people are critical, saying, well, but did Jesus say it explicitly in the New Testament? Because if he didn't say it, they right. probably don't have to do it. Right. And he, and he only said half of them that time. Like, does the poor man need to say literally the yeah. whole Bible every Come on. time he opens his mouth? Give him a break. Right. And so there's, there's such a pattern in all of these passages that you're bringing up. Do this because it is embodying the Torah and the prophets, and that is the goal. Right. And right. the very first one that you brought up was that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth. There we go. That's at the beginning of Matthew, at the beginning of Yeshua's teaching. Yeah. And he's so repetitive with this. I don't need to tell you what it says. You know what the Torah and the prophets say. All I'm telling you to do is if you want to do it, which is the goal, this is how you do it. Write it on your heart so that you'll know how to love your neighbor really well. That's what he came to explain. He didn't have to literally say everything. Right. And so that's just seeing that pattern in all these yeah. passages that you're going to have. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Dennis. Quite often when uh, 
rabbis or Jews when they study scripture, even in the New Testament, when we uh, have disciples giving us the word, there's a word called remez. That's how they did Bible studies. By, like, like, for example, John says, in the beginning was the word. The word was God. The word was God. So when he said so, that says in the beginning, everybody listening to him who knows the Torah would we think automatically Genesis 1-1 that we know of. You know, in the beginning God created. That's Ramez. I see that here. Because when Yeshua is speaking here, and he says, if you ask for a fish, shall we give him a stone or a snake? If you then, being wicked, know how to give good gifts, right there, that's a remez for a lot of people listening to this because they know word pictures of what wicked is from a lot of Old <laughs> Testament. And uh, the word picture of wicked is a wick and a candle. Uh. If it's twisted, it's going to burn well. But, it, I mean, it's not going to burn well. If it's braided, it's going to burn well. That's where you get uh. the light of truth. So wicked is taking the truth but twisting it. Wow. So even a wicked person knows the basic truth and knows how to give good gifts. How much more if someone who has the directly or, or correctly divided the word of God has the fear of God in them, how much more shall your father who is in heaven give these good gifts where the truth comes from? Beautiful. That's great. Thank you. All right. Moving on. There's going to be another picture, kids. Hang on. I uh, need a reader. Who's got it? Then Yeshua spoke to the crowds and to his top ones, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. Therefore, whatever they say to you, to guard, guard and do. But do not do according to their works. For they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But with their finger they do not wish to move them. Okay. Uh, you probably have seen this uh, before. This is the, the seat of Moshe, Moses. And uh, traditionally, if you don't know about this, traditionally, this is the, the physical seat that we're in the synagogues where uh, the person who was in charge of reading from the scrolls would uh, have a seat. Um, it's kind of like a chair of honor, I guess. Um, so generally, each, each synagogue would have one of those. Um, let's identify our quotes here. We have uh, just one. And um, initially, when I was studying this, I considered this an illusion. But when I studied it more and more, I really thought, you know, I think he's actually quoting uh, this passage here in Deuteronomy. Uh, if you look at this, it's not obviously a word-for-word -word quote, but if you compare um, in Deuteronomy, Moshe is talking about the Levites, the priests, and the judges. They were the legal authorities of the day. And he's saying you have to do what they say. And Yeshua is really doing the same thing with the Pharisees, saying that, you know, they are seated in that position of authority, and you need to do what they say. So there's definitely a connection there. So I'm calling it a quote. Um, so back to the physical seat. I also learned that there's some differences of opinion uh, to the protocols of this seat. Uh, sometimes you, you may hear that uh, the people who sit in the seat, they can only read the scripture uh, from the seat. Um, they can't make any comments. They can only um, read actually from the scripture. And then also I read that uh, they stood up to read the scripture. And when they finish reading the scripture, then they would sit down and make their comments. So I'm not 100% sure exactly what the practice was in that day. We do know, um, many people think that this passage here is talking about the seat of Moshe. You know, because it's it's saying that in every Sabbath, um, you know, they're gonna they're gonna hear from Moshe um, in the synagogues, and we also know for a fact that Yeshua uh, participated in this practice. Who can read this passage for me? I mean, you got that? Aim. Thank you. 
And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And according to his practice, he went into the congregation on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Yeshiyahu was handed to him. And having unrolled the scroll, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of Yahweh is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to send away crushed ones with a release, to proclaim the acceptable year of Yahweh. And having rolled up the scroll, he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the congregation were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been filled in your hearing. Boy, I would have loved to have been there. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I would have loved to have been there on that day. Uh, we do know this for a fact, though, that Yeshua stood up to read, and he sat down to comment. That's what the scripture says there. So at least uh, during his time, that's what he did um, in that particular synagogue. Um, let me look at one more thing here before we discuss this. So hold your thoughts. Um, uh, let's see. Wait. Don't look at that yet. No, we're right. Now you can look at it. Okay. Sorry. Here's our next one. Go ahead, David. Uh, or, hold, the read. hold your thoughts. We're going to come back. But what read that. To the scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you are the, you tithe the mint and the anise and the cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the Torah, the right ruling and the compassion and the belief. These need to have been done without neglecting the other. Blind guides straining out a, uh, a gnat and swallowing a camel, a one-hump camel. One-hump camel. Okay. So, we're going to categorize this uh, categorize this as an illusion. Um, one of the topics that he's talking about here is tithing, of course, and that's an Old Testament subject. So, um, we can gain some insight. Um, now, there, the types of ties that uh, I've came across um, are listed here, and I'm not really sure which one the tithing of the mint and cumin would fall under. But um, we know that Yeshua's, you know, it's, the Pharisees were doing pretty good with that part of tithing, at least. They, uh, it was the, there's something else that w was getting them, and it was the weightier matters. So, what are, I'm sorry, Brendan, what? I did, but if you say it out loud, then everyone's going to get the prize. So you better keep it in your head. Mm. Oh, too late, Brendan. That's okay. You're a smart guy. Um, what are the weightier matters? He said that's what they're neglecting here. They were taking care of the tithing on the smaller stuff, but the weightier matters is what uh, was a problem. And if you look at the definition uh, in Strong's for weightier, heavy in weight, weighty, well, I don't think he's talking about the weightier matters of Torah like oxen and, you know, bags of uh, grain. I think he's talking more about weightier in terms of importance or the value you know, maybe even how it affects others. That's the weightier matters. And, and what are these weightier matters? Well, he tells us uh, right ruling. Right ruling, compassion, and belief. And uh, we'll look at what the Torah says about those. So here's what the Torah says about right ruling, which you might call justice. Who can read this one for me? David, you got to go ahead. Deuteronomy. Appoint judges and officers within all your gates, which Yahweh your Elohim is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous right ruling. Do not distort right ruling, do not show partiality, nor take a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. So that's pretty clear. That is 
you know, pretty much a direct Torah command to have right ruling, justice. Um, pretty straight ahead there. Now, with compassion, I didn't, I wasn't able to find one specific command, thou shalt be compassionate. Didn't really say it like that, but there were uh, three or four um, that were definitely related to compassion or mercy. Um, we won't read those, um, but very applicable to what we're talking about. And this is not an exhaustive list. There may be more. I don't know. Um, and the last one, belief or faith or faithfulness, this was the hardest one to find a direct command in Torah that tell you to be faithful. Uh, it's more just woven into the fabric of the Torah. Um, but these are some examples that I came up in terms of um, being being faithful or seeing it. Uh, so what's Yeshua's point here? Um, to me, it, it's get your priorities straight. You know, know, know what's most important. Don't get wrapped up in all the details that you lose sight of the bigger picture, the weightier matters. And uh, remember Yeshua's quote from Hosea? You know, this is, this is the same thing. It's talking about the weightier matters. I desire the compassion over the offering. That's the weightier matter there. Dennis has a comment. I wanted to cross-reference that with Luke 11.42. Okay. It says, But woe unto you Pharisees, for ye tithe mint and ruin every herb, and pass over justice and the love of God. Mint was not really anything in the Old Testament that says you must tithe because it was just like for us like a weed or an herb that we use just to garnish our main food. It was not considered something of a main instance that you should be tithing. It was just an extra fence law. Yeah. Um, Good point. But the more weightier things is the justice and the love of God. That's yeah. Luke 11, yeah. Yeah, the good. So just remember what he said. Oh, I'm sorry, Eliza. Human is uh, a part of the commanded, um, even if it's not specified. Specified is a part of the commanded um, things, but but it's not the weightier matters. Yeah. Obviously. And I think that it's important that he said these weightier matters need to be done without neglecting the others. Yeah. It is good that you keep the letter of the law and not one jot or tittle will pass away from it. You will still tie your mint in your anus, but immediately after this, he tells them to wash the inside of the cup so that the outside don't yeah. clean the outside. You're just full of dead men. That's actually the way to matter in your heart, not just even what you do you appear to be good. In the tithing mint or anything is very small piece of your outward But even if it's really, even if you give away all your money to the poor, if you still don't have love for them and the inside of your cup isn't clean, then you're missing the mercy. Yeah. So, but I think that, that it's important it's like every single word you know, this isn't in vain that he says this is important. It needs to be done without neglecting right. small also. Yeah, I yeah, I have that on the next slide actually. Yeah, because that's so important. You know, we can't just neglect that. And you know, what are these others that are neglected? You know, maybe that's between you and the Lord. I don't know. I know in my own life, you know, some people some people may think it's it. Uh, you know, or no big deal. And maybe they neglect that. Or some people, um, you know, getting every speck of leaven out of your house. Ah, we got most of it. I don't know. That's between you and the Lord, uh, what what that is. But the point is, he says not to neglect it. We we, we have to really examine that. David. Now, the, uh, you had mentioned about the word belief or faith. Uh, so much of this has brought me back to the, the, the culmination in, in Deuteronomy where Moses is you know, reiterating and summing it up uh, and 
I look at Deuteronomy 30 where it says, you know, this command is not too far away. It's, you know, it's not in the heavens, not over the sea, it's, uh, in your mouth and in your heart. Which then Paul, uh, of course, quotes in Romans. And what is he talking about there? Faith. Which is, so it's your, there's your three-way business of manifestation or clarification. <coughs> you know, so... Um, all of these, uh, se several of these things come back to what uh, Moses is saying to say, you know, he's setting it before you. This command, he's setting before you today, life and death. And what believer does not agree with that? Yeah. Uh, so, so, you know, putting the connection points together, that's, uh, you, we shouldn't be denying that Yeshua is upholding every word uh, that is spoken. Absolutely. Okay. Last one. You guys are doing great. Last one. Here we go. Who's got it? One more reader. Laura? And Yeshua came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Son of Heart Spirit teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. Okay. So this is the uh, known as the Great Commission, right? And um, I'm, of course, not saying that every single thing that he commanded was directly from the Old Testament in this. But as our, our illusion here shows, is that what he has commanded much of what he's commanded is uh, directly from the Old Testament. As a matter of fact, if you look at this, these are the ones that I came up with, and we've looked at all of those except for one today. I think Matthew 19, we didn't look at that. But all of those others are direct, um, direct times when Yeshua is pointing to obeying the Torah. Um, so that's part of what he commanded. So that's part of the Great Commission. Uh, there's no way around it. Okay? Closing thoughts on that, anybody? It's just kind of a summary, but go ahead. Just a question. What percentage did you come up with then? Well, I, I can't really answer that um, all the way because I just did Matthew. Um, but the only thing I can base it on is I could only find 19 references that he had and 66 that I had. So I'm on my way to having a much bigger percentage unless the other three Gospels have way fewer uh, than I think, but I don't, I don't believe so. Laura. And I'm just looking at that where it says all I have commanded. That is not excluding any of the commands. He's also said previously as we went over that he's not come to do away with any of it. And if you read the Old Testament and everything that he's referencing, how many times can you count when he says this is an everlasting statute to be observed throughout all your generations in your household? Kind of a no-brainer. If you think that he is the Word embodied and the Word was God and the Word was with God from the beginning, Yeshua was there. He was God when he commanded everything that's ever been done. So I think that that gets lost with a lot of people in my family that I talk That Yeshua, Jesus did command us to do all these things. He is the Lord. Yeah. He was part of God. When he Any other thoughts? <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what I came up with. Um, and like I said, maybe I'll have time to expand it beyond Matthew later.